Good morning, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this, the 22nd meeting of the Standards, Procedure and Public Appointments Committee in 2024. I have no uh, apologies this morning, but we do welcome back a former member in the form of Sue Webber, MSP. Um, so, at the first agenda item, Sue, is there anything that you would like to declare by way of any relevant interests? Thank you very much for that kind, those kind words, convener, and I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And once again, welcome, welcome back. Um, I hope the committee will be content for me to write to Oliver Mundell, MSP, um, to express both mine and the committee's thanks for his work while he was on. Thank you. Agenda item two is the decision on taking uh, business in private. And this is whether the committee are agreeable to taking items four and five in private. Agenda item four is consideration of an applications for the role of committee advisor in connection with our inquiry into committee effectiveness. And agenda item five is further consideration of the recommendations of the gender sensitive audit. Are members happy to take those in private? I'm grateful. Which brings us to the substantive part of today's meeting, which is agenda item three, which is to take evidence on the Scottish Elections Representations and Reform Bill. And I'd like to welcome Detective Chief Inspector Craig Chisholm of Police Scotland to the meeting this morning. Good morning. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to express um, DCI Chisholm, um, both to you and to your colleagues, for your assistance in giving evidence today, because it it was over a much shorter notice period um, than we would normally provide and um, your assistance is deeply appreciated with this matter given the timetabling of the bill that we're, we're looking at. The purpose of taking evidence today is for the committee to understand a little bit more about the operation of the sex offender notification requirements or SONA orders under part two of the Sexual Offence Act 2003 and other related orders in connection with the proposed amendments to the Scottish Elections Representation and Reform Bill, there is a proposal that the effect of such orders would disqualify individuals subject to these orders from being a candidate or for continuing to hold elected office as a local authority councillor in Scotland or indeed as an MSP. The committee has previously expressed its support in principle for the introduction of such a provision, but we want to ensure a proper understanding of these orders in advance of stage two proceedings on this bill. Um, if it is all right with you, DCI Chisholm, I'll invite the committee to put some questions to you about it. Um, but exercising my privilege of convener, I was going to go first, if that's all right. If there are any um, if, if you require any further explanation as to the meaning of our questions or indeed you would like the opportunity to consider your answer and write to us further, I'm more than happy for you to do that, um, given both the circumstances of the relatively short notice, but more importantly, actually, because of the significance um, this aspect will bring to the bill here in Scotland. So probably to, to kick off, um, can you explain the, the role of Police Scotland and, as I understand it, the Chief Inspectors in relation to um, the sex offender notification requirements. What happens on a sort of day-to-day -day basis? Who holds responsibility? And what are the sorts of um, orders and individuals that you're dealing with? Hey, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me here today. Um, I hope to be able to help you with my uh, knowledge. Um, I think it would probably be wise to talk through what the notification requirements are, first of all, if that makes sense, just to get a better understanding of, of what that would be. So basically, the application of not notification requirements, which is commonly, commonly referred to as the sex offender notification requirements, which is shortened to SONAR. If you talk to a lot of police officers, that's what they'll refer it to, SONAR. It's not a sentencing option for the court, but it's an automatic consequence of conviction for a, a relevant sexual offence. Okay? Any offender who has received a conviction or finding in respect of a specified sexual offence under Schedule 3 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 is automatically subject to the notification requirements of Part 2 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 and identified as a registered sex offender. Okay. Um, there is one exception to this, um, where a sheriff or a judge does have the ability to apply, to apply SONAR and this is a, in the respect of paragraph 60 of section, uh, Schedule 3 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003, 
to utilise this, the sheriff or the judge must make the decision that there is a significant sexual aspect to the offender's behaviour in relation to an offence not listed within six, uh, Schedule 3 of the Sexual Offences Act. Okay. An example of that would maybe uh, somebody that commits a breach of the peace, um, but there's a sexual element to their behaviour within that offending, if that makes sense. They can apply Section 60, which would then mean that that individual then becomes um, a sex offender. Um, when paragraph 60 is applied the sheriff, by the sheriff or the judge, then the duration of the, the notification, the sonar, is again dictated by the sentence issued for that conviction and not by the sheriff or the judge. So the length of time a registered sex offender is subject to notification requirements is dictated by the sentence issued for that conviction and age at the time of the conviction. Okay. The notification periods are dictated by Section 82 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 and are listed within a table. Okay. So the judge doesn't get to decide or the sheriff doesn't get to decide how long somebody's on the register. It just depends on what, what, the, the, what sentence they give them. It's related to what's on the table. Does that make sense? Yeah. And appearing on the register is not actually part of the sentence. It's something that flows as a result of the conviction or indeed the judge deciding in limited cases this has a sexual element and the, the individual should be on the register. Yes, exactly. Um, so once they're convicted, it becomes it then when they get sentenced, it depends what the sentence is, depends how long somebody is on the, the register, the subject to notification requirements, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, there is a table. The table is kind of self-explanatory. You can be on indefinitely. You can be on for 10 years, 7 years, 2 years, 5 years. just depends what the, the sentence is. Um, what I would just add there, no, nobody is really on indefinitely. Um, when somebody's on indefinitely, uh, there's legislation in place in Scotland that the police are duty bound to review that individual's um, to review the notification requirements after 15 years. If that makes sense. Um, when I'm sorry, sorry, Tisia, and the the review is undertaken by the police. What is the test that the police put to decide whether or not the um, notification period should come to an end? Is 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 there a, a set of tests that are applied? It's basically from a risk assessment. Um, and if uh, it's assessed that the individual still presents a risk of serious sexual harm to the public, um, then the decision will be made to um, for, notification, for a continuation order, if that makes sense. That can be up to 15 years, but it's determined by the police. And we can maybe, maybe put it for two years and review it after two years or, or whatever time frame. And that's, that's, a, that's a responsibility of the Chief Constable, but that's discharged to detective superintendents to make that decision within each of the 13 local policing divisions. So even though the language um, is an indefinite period, yeah. the period of time an individual spends under the notification is reviewed, and if they remain um, in a notification situation, it's because the police have reviewed the situation and assessed that individual to be a continuing risk. Yes, that's correct. And also, if the, if the individual that's been subject to the continuation, if they don't agree with that, they can appeal to the sheriff. Yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, when an offender is also under 18 at the relevant date, the length of time that they are subject to notification requirements, as described in the Section 82 table, is halved. Okay, so it's, so it's half. For, so say something that's like 10 years, it would be five years if they were under 18. That makes sense. Um, Sorry, I forget. What happens um, on their 18th birthday if it happens, say, they're 17? It's, it's when the offender is under a relevant date, they're a length of time they're subject to it's, right. it's usually when, they're, they're, it's when they offend. So it's they, irrelevant, really, the yeah, birthday. It, so it's still, yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. like it's, you it's turn 18 yeah. and you get the no, adult no. part. No, no. Okay. Um, Sonar requires offenders. So notification requirements basically requires offenders to notify certain personal details, um, along with any subsequent changes to those details to the police within required pre prescribed time, time frames, if that makes sense. Um, any failure to do so is a criminal offence and it's punishable by imprisonment. Um, any offender subject to a sex, offend, sex offender order, a sexual offences prevention order, or a sexual harm prevention order 
is, sub is automatically subject to notification requirements as well, by virtue of being subject to that order. Um, and any offender who has been convicted of breaching a risk of sexual harm order or a sexual risk order is subject to a not SONA notification and becomes an, a registered sex offender as a result of that breach. Okay. I'd just explore that in a little bit more detail because some of the notification arises in effect from a, a criminal conviction under Schedule 3, as you've described, but some of those, the, the sexual risk orders, um, they're also civil orders. Is that right? Yes. So actually, when for the purposes of this Act, we're looking at um, the registration having taken place, the registration under it could have been occasioned by a civil case um, with a, a different burden of proof and things like that. But the Police Scotland would treat the notification, the individual who is subject to the notification in exactly the same way, irrespective of why the notification has arisen. If that make, does that make sense? Yes, that's correct. <coughs> so it, it, under a civil order, the um, formal notification to the police that this individual has to register is because once the notification is made, they are required to notify to the police, as you said, with name, address and various other details. Yes. And indeed to keep that up to date if, if those circumstances change. Yep. Are the police made aware of individuals who should register in any other way? Or is the obligation just on the individual? The obligation is um, on the individual. However, depending on the individual circumstances um, and their needs, we will try and accommodate it as best we can. It, it, it's really much on an individual basis. We'll look at that. Um, an individual might have some you know, diverse or, or mental health or, or other issue. That Obviously, we will take that into consideration and, and ensure that they, they, they know, they're aware of their obligations yeah. uh, under notification requirements, because uh, it would be quite challenging. And obviously, the number of sex offenders uh, across the country, um, it, we need to look at, and it's, it's very much bespoke to the individual, if that makes sense. I was, I was going to say, so actually, the interaction between the police under the notification um, and the individual is, is to, to use your word, is a, is, is a bespoke process for the yes. individual who's in front of you. Yeah, each individual that's subject to notification requirement on a sex offender um, is monitored and managed by the police and other MAPA responsible authorities in the community. And ultimately, to do that is that to manage the risk that they present to the, their communities. And it's for us to try and mitigate and negate any of that risk as best we can uh, to protect the public. You, you used the acronym MAPA there, which has appeared in chunks of our evidence. Would you like to explain what that is? Yes. Uh, rather than who it is. Yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> Give me two seconds to find my right notes. I've, I've made quite a few notes here just so I'm not telling no, no, you the wrong no, stuff. No, no, please, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so basically since 2007, all registered sex offenders in Scotland have been subject to management through the multi-agency public protection arrangements, which is MAPA. Um, this was introduced by Sections 10 and 11 of the Management of Offenders Scotland Act, uh, 2005. Um, the, uh, the arrangements have been, are well established across the country, and through ongoing review and learning from significant case reviews, uh, the ensure practice remains current and effective. Um, MAPA exists across the UK, um, although subject to different legislation and guidance in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but the underlying principles and intentions are the same across the country. Um, MAPA is neither a body nor an organisation. Um, the arrangements are probably best thought as an overarching set of principles and guidance, if that makes sense. They enable the agencies involved in predominantly the management of registered sex offenders to share information effectively. Um, and this allows the agencies to better assess and manage, manage the risks um, that are in, 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 considered to be posed by the, by the offenders. Uh, and this is done on a case-by-case -case basis, as I've, as I've said. And it, it's simply not possible to eliminate risk entirely. Um, however, the ultimate objective of MAPA uh, and of the agencies involved in the management of MAPA offenders is to protect the public. Um, and this, by, this is done by minimising the risk of harm presented by offenders so far as it is possible to do so. Um, the key agencies involved in MAPA are referred to as responsible authorities. They include Police Scotland, uh, the local authority, Scottish Prison Service and the health boards. Um, particularly for restricted patients, but they've also got an alert duty um, in relation to other things. Police Scotland, we've got dedicated um, sex offender policing units within each of the 13 policing divisions. 
um, all trained specialist officers who um, they have the responsibility for the management of registered sex offenders in the community and they have the support of local policing colleagues and other specialist resources. Local authority involvement is provided by, predominantly by criminal justice social work, uh, children and family social work and the housing departments. Uh, they can extend to encompass a broad range of services depending on the individual circumstances of the offenders. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service is responsible for the management of registered sex offenders while they are in custody and they contribute to inform risk assessment and risk management planning for offenders being released uh, back into the community following any period in custody. Health Board's involvement is a responsibility specific towards individuals who are defined as restricted patients, um, and they are predominantly individuals who are subject to detention in a hospital setting. Um, health Boards, however, are also required to share information and in, in assist in the arrangements of any other offender, and this is where the health information and expertise is relevant. Um, there are other duty to cooperate, to, to, to cooperate agencies that are identified through legislation, um, and they are required to cooperate and share information with the responsible authorities in respect of the management of MAP offenders. Um, and basically, it's all intended to ensure all available information is gathered, shared, and used to build a complete as much a complete a picture as possible for each offender. And this allows for better identification of any key risks. Uh, that may present an implementation of appropriate measures to mitigate these risks. So the development um, of MAPA and its, 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 its ongoing development is an attempt, well not more than an attempt, it is the best vehicle for sharing data to ensure that individuals who come under this notification scheme, um, the, the various and appropriate bodies um, are aware of it, know about it, know the location, know the support that's needed. Yeah. But nothing under MAPA removes from the Chief Constable the um, administrative obligations under the SONAR. That remains with them, although they do delegate that, as, you, as you've already said. So the final responsibility, again, with regard to things like the, the indefinite periods, still rests w with Police Scotland, with the Chief Constable, as delegated. Yes, in terms of the, an individual's responsibility or obligations around their notification requirements, that sits entirely with Police Scotland, and that's why all registers, we, we're involved in the management of and monitoring of all registered sex offenders. Yeah. So, yeah. ultimately, if an individual is subject to notification requirements, they, are, they have to attend a police station, a prescribed police station, to actually provide the information that's required. And they have to do that at the relevant times and dates um, that, that, that when they're due. And as I said, if they're not, it's an offence that's then it's punishable. And, and you can obviously arrest the individual and present the, the case to the Crown, mm -hmm. the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service. Now, it's not to say that some of the other bodies, particularly, I think, of the, the, the health um, the health bodies that are involved in MAPA, they have other obligations which would relate to the individual and the care of that individual, and indeed may have um, very strong obligations to undertake some actions. That's completely separated from the SONA stuff. This is simply in respect of the notification in an, in a, um, <clears throat> in, in, to use best endeavours so that everyone is aware of the risk profile yes. that an individual makes, because at the end of the day, this is about protecting the public from the very potentially individual risks that someone may make, but it is not a sentence and it's about how they can remain in the community, but monitored appropriately and to a level that can reassure the public that as far as it's all possible, they are safe. That... Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So MAPA's, the MAPA yeah, purpose is obviously, you know, all about the rehabilitation back into the community, <coughs> but also the, the, the side to that and notification requirements is very much or the onus is on the police to manage that effectively, yes. if that makes sense. But that becomes part of our MAPA process because when somebody becomes a registered sex offender, we will go and visit that individual. We will talk through their, their, their responsibility and the requirements that's, that, that they become under, if that makes sense. Um, because it can be quite confusing for people uh, to follow the, the legislation. Um, and it's just we, we will try and keep individuals right in that respect, if that makes sense. Um, but we'll be honest and open with them that ultimately it's their responsibility to comply with those notification requirements. And some of the offences that lead to notification um, are offences that can occur in other parts of the United Kingdom, in other countries, 
Um, how does that work in relation um, to the, the practicalities of, of it? So and if, if there is an offence that's occasioned overseas, um, are you as satisfied as you can be again that if the notification um, criteria are met, that individual comes forward, notifies themselves properly and, and, and come within the system? That, that information usually comes from other law enforcement partners, uh, international. So when a person has been convicted of an offence in another country, which had, which had they been convicted in the UK, would have resulted in SONA, um, an application can be made to the court for a notification order. Um, and if granted, the offender to whom the order applies becomes a subject to SONA um, and is managed as a rights of a sex offender in the same manner if they were convicted in the UK. So it's, it, being informed by our partners, um, and an individual may be getting deported from a country, say in, in, in America or Australia, which is quite common, we'll be informed that they are obviously returning to the UK and we'll um, obviously get all the relevant information about the offence. We'll apply to the courts for a notification order and then they will become a registered sex offender the same way they, was, they would have been if they were convicted of that crime in Scotland. And again, Police Scotland, through the Chief Constable, take full responsibility um, for the notification um, enforcement and requirements, the overseas court would have nothing to do with that. Nothing to that do point. with that completely on in completely in the UK because what they add is MAP is UK. Um, so ultimately it doesn't prevent people moving across the UK. So ultimately the benefit of that's all I think probably just to re reiterate that there isn't an actual register that people think there's a register, if that makes sense. It's um, it's called a system called Visor. Um, which is a home office database that we that sex offenders are recorded on. So ultimately, all police forces and other agencies across the UK use that same system. So then all the information is on that system. So when they do move about the UK, that we can transfer that case and they'll take responsibility as a, as a kind of lead agency, if that makes sense. Okay. Also to point out as well that it's important to recognise through the MAPA, the law, there will always be a lead agency for the individual, if that makes sense. So... If somebody gets goes to court and gets in, sentenced for a community payback order, the lead agency for that case will be Justice Social Work for the relevant area, who will be supported by all other responsible authorities, particularly the police, because we still, although they're the lead agency, we still get the responsibility for the notification requirements. Once that, so, so say for instance, alternatively, somebody goes to, gets a couple of years in prison, and then they get released on licence, they will come out and there'll be a lead agency or be just a social work while they're on licence. When that licence ends, Police Scotland will become the lead agency. And it works like that until the end of the SONAR, not for the period, if they're on for five years, ten years, seven years, whatever it may yeah. be. Does that make sense? Yeah. So effectively, rather than a register, the database and MAPA allow for the pooling of that information, irrespective of the location of someone and irrespective of which the lead um, agency is in respect of the individual parts of that. Yeah. I suppose uh, to, to sort of draw back towards the bill that we're looking at at the moment, one of the questions that um, keeps returning to us is about someone who presents themselves for election um, but is on the um, notification. There is an individual responsibility for the person who's proposing themselves for election to sign a declaration, which is, if it's incorrectly done, is already a criminal offence. Um, how challenging would it be for Police Scotland if they were um, presented with an individual to see whether or not they were on the notification system and therefore and not make the judgment about whether they can or cannot stand, but actually to be able to say to, for example, a returning officer um, or some other relevant person that someone was on, was some, someone was subject to the notification requirements. Sorry, I don't, I'm not How challenging would that be if you were presented with a name and address? For the police? For the police to check whether or not that was the case. It's not challenging at all. However, I would probably suggest that it would be a responsibility from uh, the MAPA responsible authorities or the lead agency for that case. For example, if I was, had somebody that came under the register subject to notification requirements, that was a councillor. Um, I would already have expected for a disclosure to have already been made to the relevant body about that individual, even probably even before they became a registered sex offender. Does that make sense? So 
I, I would already expect that to be in the public domain or in the domain somehow. For example, say an individual that's a counsellor gets arrested for a sexual offence. Um, it's the responsibility in that scene, the investigating officer, to consider if any relevant disclosures would be required because of the risk that that individual may present to the public. Does that make sense? So, so all, notwithstanding anything in this bill, or indeed anything, there is already an assessment made of every individual who a lead agency comes into contact with as to whether or not notification is po possibly a, a, the correct way to move forward in that case, so that the work is happening even before there is a legal requirement for notification, either because of the specific schedule or a decision of a, of a judge because of the content of yeah. why they are before it, them. It would even be before that, even before somebody went to court, um, or we would have to consider if that person presents a risk. Say somebody comes in, and the, the, um, as I said, a councillor comes in and they, they're members of organisations that they, they volunteer for, uh, and they've come in for a, a sexual offence that's related to children. We would have, we, we would have to consider the relevant disclosures to those organisations to make sure that they can keep their members safe. Does that make sense? So if what I'm trying to say is that it would probably already be in the domain of if a councillor um, came across that, we would probably already have made a disclosure before the person even became a registered sex offender, if that makes sense. No, that, that, that's very helpful because at the end of the day, I think referring back to the, the individualised way that the matter is dealt with, all sits on a risk assessment that is made for the public that are around these individuals. And it's, you know, perhaps actually quite reassuring to see that um, even without some formal things happening, that how, what risk are the public being put at by this individual is already assessed both by, as you say, by Police Scotland, but by the other lead agencies. Within MAPA, disclosures are a very big part of it, if that makes sense. There's lots of different schemes. Um, in different ways and means that we can do it through well, child protection, adult protection, public interest disclosure. There's lots of different ways in which we can disclose. We always go down the route of the individual self-disclosing in the first instance, and then we'll, we would verify and check that, if that makes sense, to make sure that the full um, disclosure had been made. Um, and if not, we would then follow up as appropriate. Thank you. Sue, I think you wanted to come in. This might have been covered, and I'm really sorry, I was just doing day one. We've heard a lot about what happens if an existing councillor, a serving councillor, creates, has, does an offence. But what happens to stop them from standing in the first place? Uh, that would be out of your hands, wouldn't it, to Com that regard? Yep, yeah, completely, because the, the, that would have to be the gov... I don't really know the ins and outs of what your uh -huh. governance is round about that, yeah. and it would have to be the governance and what checks and balances happen you, with, would, you would happen... In terms of selection? Or in terms of selection or somebody becoming a... You know, to stand. Yeah, OK, thanks. Members have any other question? Yeah, no, yeah, no, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. It's particularly helpful to understand that there isn't really an indefinite notification period with the with the reviews and the appeal. And I think in the context of the bill, that's helpful to know. Um, is there anything else that you would like to? <laughs> no, it's just that, uh, what I would say. It's a very complex field. Um, and I can understand it's quite difficult to grasp, but sometimes it's still difficult after years working in it. That, that it's still challenging, if that makes sense. Um, if you do have any inf anything else comes up, feel, feel free to ask, and I'll provide as much information as I can to help. Um, it's not, not an issue at all. Can, can I thank you and the, um, your colleagues and, indeed, Police Scotland, for, as I say, managing to do this at, 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 at much shorter notice than we, we, we normally do, but it's been an incredibly helpful um, evidence session. And I'm glad you've offered, if we have additional questions, to come back to you. Um, but can I reciprocate if there's anything that you feel that you would have liked to have added that we couldn't? Please feel free to contact us. Through. Sorry, yes. I was actually, when I was reading one of the mm -hmm. letters that was submitted uh, to the... Um, there was a couple of points I just wanted to raise. It was probably the letter dated the 24th of October. Yeah. Um, just to confirm that this is a letter from the Scottish Government um, to this committee where they outline their um, thinking for amendments that they may bring. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just one of the things that came up. It's just when I was reading it. it. It's in the third page, Annex A. Yeah. Um, there's a paragraph in, in the proposed scheme. Um, there's just a little in the the fourth paragraph, when it starts, well, no new sopples or rochels can be imposed. 
the last sentence of that, that it says the latest possible date for them to cease to have effect being the 31st of March 2028. I would probably query that. That's probably incorrect. Um, because a law... I'll just read the paragraph and I'll explain yeah, that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, <laughs> yeah. Well known, well known use Sopos or Rochos. So what you need to remember, Sopos and Rochos were replaced in 2023 by sexual risk orders. It can be transitional and savings provisions in Section 40 of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016 and Regulation 4 of SSI 2035-51 mean that orders existing at that date remain in operation. So the latest possible date for them to cease to have effect um, being the 31st of March 2028. I'm not too sure what they mean by that because... Sopos, although they're granted for five years as a minimum, they can be granted for 10, 20, 30 years. So I'm not too sure they won't cease to affect at that point. There'll they, they, still be other ones in operation. It's just a little technical matter. No. That so it would, be, it would be helpful for this committee to contact the Scottish Government and ask for a clarification um, in respect of all of them finishing on the 31st of March 2028 yeah. or actually finishing when they do. They finish when they're determined when by they what do. was issued by the court. But also, also just maybe add as well, Police Scotland, um, as part of our processes, um, although shoppers are uh, and shoppers and are issued by the courts for a certain period, we always keep them under review as well. We can actually um, make a request to the court to discharge a SOPO if you feel that that individual doesn't no longer presents a risk or we've got a requirement to have that order to continue in place. That makes sense. It, it, that again is, a, a, ref, a, is a, um, a parallel of the responsibility for the Chief Constable with regard to indefinite ones to review it and if it ceases to be needed actually to actively remove it. Yeah. Um, and if the police choose to, <clears throat> the Chief Constable chooses not to remove it, um, that decision could still be reviewed, could still be sent to review by the individual to a sheriff to look at it again. Not for that's for the indefinite review, for the, right. the review of shoppers and soppos and yeah. with sexual risk orders. Um, we can we can review it and say we can ask we can make an application to the police can make an application to the court for that to be discharged. If that makes sense. Right, and if you choose not to, if, if, if the decision was taken not to. So it would continue on. Would the individual then it have continue a right? until the end date of the, no, just the order? End date. And it would be up to us if we, if we considered that individual <clears throat> continued to pose a risk, we could submit another application yeah. to the court. However, um, it has to be there's quite a high threshold that has to be met for the for a sheriff for a judge to, to, to you know to actually commission another order. If that makes sense. And again, there has to be some form of behaviour by the individual within that interim period. Uh, yes, that, that, that's what I was going to ask. There has to be some additional evidence from the occasioning of the first order that, uh, and, and common sense says, if there hadn't been, it's unlikely that you would pursue it unless there was some yeah. very cunning reason why. But it would be that subsequent behaviour that would again be looked at by the courts and, if appropriate, would then come under the new scheme of notification. Yeah, it would, it would then, once a new order is issued, it become, there'd be subject to notification for yes. that period. The only anomaly in that, sorry, just to go back yeah. to other stuff, is your um, sexual risk orders. That individual is not subject to <laughs> SONA initially. Does right. that make sense? Yes, no, that does make sense. Thank you for that. No problem, I see, sorry. I see, I see a wonderful, wonderful letter going to the, the Scottish Government. No, um, it was just, it, just it, I, I don't know what they meant, but, but it just, it, it, it's not, it, that, although they are for five years, they can be for much longer. And we have got ones that are for much longer for from my, years ago that are still in play, if that makes sense. No, can I thank you for that? Because one of the purposes of bringing experts in to give evidence is exactly for, the, for that purpose. So can I thank you very much, and again, both your colleagues and Police Scotland generally for that. Thank, thank you. you. I will, um, yes, um, I'm now going to move this meeting into private. <laughs>